Good evening to everyone joining us and welcome. I'm David, a bookseller at Literati, and we are pleased to welcome Jenny Liu to our At Home with Literati series in support of Muscle Memory. She will be joined in conversation by John Vercher. And just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep your chat window open as I'll be dropping links to purchase the book from Literati throughout the event. The Q&A is accessible, so please submit questions if you have them. Uh, live transcription is available on your toolbar as well. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, the links to purchase books are in the description. Now, just a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in southeastern Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd like to thank you for your attendance this evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. And now, allow me to introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Jenny Liu is an English professor at Pierce College and a retired professional cage fighter. She lives and writes in Covington, Washington. John Vercher lives in the Philadelphia area with his wife and two sons. He has a bachelor's in English from the University of Pittsburgh and an MFA in creative writing from the Mountain View Master of Fine Arts program. He's a contributing writer for WBUR Boston's Cognoscenti, and NPR features his essays on race, identity, and parenting. His debut novel, Three Fifths, was named one of the best books of the year by the Chicago Tribune, Crime Reads, and Booklist. It was nominated for the Edgar Anthony and Strand Magazine Critics Awards for Best First Novel. And I will leave you. Enjoy. So I think we both just decided uh, off camera or out of the webinar that this is Jenny's launch. So it only makes sense that we get to hear her read from this incredible collection. So Jenny, I'm gonna turn it over to you to start us off. All right, thank you, John. Um, I'm just gonna read you a few poems and then we'll hear from John. And then I think uh, we have lots of questions and conversation that we're eager to get to. Uh, this is a poem called Scansion Between the Rokes. Here is the myth of poetry, of what it has lost and is forever trying to recover. Poetry was feet on a road, breath nudging lungs, hands on a foe or beloved. And then we wrote it down and printed it, wrung the life out of it, threw away the flesh. But for five rounds, none of that was true. The jab cross is the boxer's eye out, the jab jab cross for Anapest. I was really excited to read here with John tonight for many reasons, but one of them was I felt like I got to uh, choose some of the uh, most fighting fight poems out of the whole collection and uh, read them back to back. Uh, so I'm gonna just jump right into another one that's called Dirty Boxing. Tommy said I needed him because I couldn't box. That part was true. He said he'd keep my face unscathed, my pockets full. Tommy had been good, I'll give him that. Eighth in the world in his day. Young men lined up in the gym just for a chance to work the mitts with him. I got better fast and the girls who used to beat me quit mid round with bloody eyes and teeth. He knew Latin, I don't know why. So what became a game, shouting commands and answering them in a tongue that in the boxing gym belonged only to us. Fighting as a game of getting close enough to wound someone then fading before their turn. But Tommy taught me dirty boxing, staying close, walking into blows so that they land, but never with full force. You learn to make your body listen to your mind and not your reflexes, ignoring the bruises bluing beneath your shirt, thinking you're learning the secrets of staying too close to get hurt. All right, John and I were talking a little earlier about our love for various martial arts. And I am a through and through grappler. I, <laughs> I love the ground fight. I love all of the little techniques, especially the tricky ones. And so I wanted to uh, end with a poem that's sort of uh, about, it's about the, the, the sort of like long, slow end of my fighting career. It's also about heel hooks. Um, how many stages of grief? She barely slipped away. I almost trapped her in a heel hook 
but she angled out of it and then I took a beating. Afterwards, the doctor says into my one good eardrum that the other one is ruptured. I shouldn't be surprised after the punches I ate. It's inoperable. I'll have to wait. It shouldn't, but the diagnosis pleases me with its promise that doing nothing is a form of self-repair. All right, I'll stop here and uh, hand the virtual mic over to John. See, it's actually hard for me to go into reading after hearing that because you picked three out of like 15 of the ones that I was like, I have to ask her about this line. I have to ask her about this poem. And so you've, you've already read at least three of those because there are some just at a line level that some of these some of these poems that you've written are just incredible. So hard to follow. Um, I uh, thank you for inviting me to read uh, on your launch. So I will I'll just read a couple pages from the beginning of After the Lights Go Out. Um, and uh, I guess that'll be it. I'll give you just a slight bit of context. After the Lights Go Out is about an MMA fighter uh, on the, the wrong side of 30, um, suffering with CTE. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, that's chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or more commonly known as pugilistic dementia. Um, um, to give you much more context, this is not necessary, just know in this opening chapter, he's dealing with those things uh, right away. So uh, the first chapter is called My Mind Playing Tricks on Me. Any Ghetto Boys fans out there, that's I stole that title. So last year, he left his groceries in the trunk for two days. He'd just gotten the call, a number one contender fight. After alternating wins and losses, he'd strung the four in a row, evading a cut from the roster by the slimmest of margins. The old time, the journeyman. Not a has been, but it never was. In spite of, no, because of the doubters and their calls to leave his gloves in the middle of the cage, no one would have thought less of him if he'd quit on his own terms. The game had passed Xavier Scarecrow Wallace by. Too many young bucks on the come up looking for a stepping stone to the next level. The cage had no place for old toothless lions fighting for their pride. And then four in a row. No tomato cans either. Championship kickboxers, jujitsu aces, each one of them the next big thing. But none had the grind in them, all talent and hormones. Cardio made cowards of them all. Xavier dragged them into deep waters, the championship rounds where lactic acid torched muscles, where deep breaths provided no oxygen, only the desperate need to breathe deeper, faster. Shoulders ached, submissions lacked squeeze, punches lost their snap, kicks sloppy, thrown with languid legs, hinging and pivoting at the joints from sheer momentum. Break the spirit and the body follows fast behind. But he paid a cost for his time in the deep end too. Worse than the patchwork remnants of stitches in his forehead, worse than the accumulation of crackling scar tissue above his jagged orbital bones, worse even than the seemingly interminable intensifying headaches. Worse than all that was the forgetting. Mild at first, sketches of time gone, Sketches of memories swiped from a chalkboard where only the faintest outline of the words and images remained. More and more often feeling that he'd been somewhere, done something, though never sure how, when, or if. The ravages of age, he told himself, nothing more. Some days he almost believed that. And then I'll stop there. Here makes so. me poems about uh, <laughs> about my own headaches <laughs> I don't care, so. yeah right it's it's the it's one of those trophies you don't want to earn it's one of those medals you don't want um so we were talking uh, uh, a little bit before we went live about how both of our works are set in this mma world but they're not really about mma although to sort of the outside observer somebody who's familiar with the sport, it might seem like that's all they're about. And I wonder, you know, in the writing of this um, and now in the launch and the reading of this, how, how has that come to, how have you, have you come to deal with that on the road, encountering people who are either really familiar with the sport or not at all? And, and how do you strike a balance with that? 
so I don't think I've learned how to deal with it at all. Um, I was like. giving <laughs> I was giving an in-person reading just the other day, and for some reason, I think this I didn't go out and about very much for a while during COVID. And I'm like, I get to go places. And I was wearing like a leopard print skirt. And I was like, oh, this is great. Until someone was like, what's an arm bar? And then I was like, I want to show you. And I was like, I'm wearing a skirt. And there was just a whole thing where I was just sort of like, oh my gosh, like um, there's just so much to explain in a way that will like, I think never fit into any Q and A. Um, and so I, I don't know. I think I've tried to like nudge people out of getting stuck on the questions about like, what is cage fighting? Mm -hmm. Like you really punch someone in the face and like nudge them instead <laughs> towards like getting punched in the face or punching someone in the face is actually much lesser violence than some of the things that happen in what just feels like the dailiness of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're kind of like amazed or appalled by the spectacle of like one woman hitting another woman, um, then maybe let's go from there to shifting the gaze towards all of the other sort of violences that I think a lot of us just take for granted and deal with in our everyday lives. Um, so I think that has really been my approach there. Um, it's honestly, I think, something that I'm still reckoning with. I think this book started off as a collection of poems um, with a lot of the fight po poems in place. And I kept telling my editor, like, I just need to write the hinges. I like need to make this fight narrative unfold. And then I went through like this really stressed out year in which I failed to write what I thought of as the hinges. And I kept writing poems about gardens. And I was like, what is happening to my brain? This is the weirdest form of procrastination. I'm so embarrassed. I like just can't write the poems I obviously need to write. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then she asked to see them and I was like, so, sorry, <laughs> I'll show them to you. I'm sorry, this isn't the book we talked about. Uh, and then she looked at them and was like, oh, like this, this is the book we talked about. And I think that journey really helped me to understand that to the degree that this is a book about fighting, it's a book about finding our ways back to our bodies um, and the, like how that sort of, anchors some of the more cerebral kinds of violence that I think all of us experience just by like existing in this day and age. Um, right. and so for me, like fighting is a way of knowing my family. Um, uh, Kung Fu was one of the practices <laughs> that my dad was able to bring with him from China to Taiwan to the US, um, you know, making those uh, leaps where he was able to bring almost nothing material. Uh, and then all of the garden poems that kind of came to realize like, oh, this is another way of being in our bodies and like working, uh, working the earth uh, and sharing those family stories as well. Yeah, I'm curious what this looks like for you as well. I had the same question reading your book. It's, it's been interesting. So, I mean, I, I think I mentioned that I, I was, I, I did an on-air interview and it, uh, while, while it was a great interview, I did feel like a lot of the times I had to sort of redirect the kind of morbid curiosity about the sport because you know it, I people that people that watch the sport regularly I think appreciate that it's not really any more brutal than boxing or football I mean god all you got to do is look at a couple of weeks ago with uh, Tua from the Dolphins and see this guy posturing on the field after a hit like it's it is it is it's up there with I mean sports for the most part are violent um but there's something about it being in the cage. And, you know, I think going back to the days of John McCain calling it human cockfighting and, you know, there's, there's just this stigma that's been around it. And, and granted, you know, we don't all, you know, people that participate in it don't always help that stigma, but, <laughs> but um, it, it's, so it's, it's been interesting. Like the, the people that get it, just get it. And they kind of understand that it, at least in my book, MMA was a bridge to tell these other stories you know, I was much more interested in telling a story about memory and family and loyalty, but I thought MMA was the perfect, perfect venue in which to like ground these stories um, because of the effects, the willing effects we take on our memories to participate in it. Um, so it, it hasn't been too bad. It, it, it's there. There have certainly been some that are, that are really more fascinated with the fighting side of it. Um and I'm happy to talk about that too when people ask about it, because just because I love 
I, I have a love hate relationship with the sport, honestly, which is something I'll love to ask you about later. But, um, but it, but it has been interesting how reactions have either been um, solely focused on the sport or really on the the family dynamics and and identity things. So, but I wanted to ask you because you you brought up a great point about the violence like in our daily lives and in your very first poem pulling punches there was um there was a line and i believe it's it's uttered by your mother when she yells stop and i like i kind of like seized when that happened because i thought there was something else coming like i thought this was leading to and maybe it was like sort of an allegory for abuse or or some other violence but then the line that follows it is let him play. And I, it seemed to me like you were saying something about sort of violence as play, like in our, in our sort of normal daily lives. And I'm wondering if like, that was your intention there. And like, you know, obviously in poetry, you've got to be very intentional about the words you choose because you have such a short space in which to <laughs> use them. So I'm just curious as to what you were getting at in that section. What were you thinking? Was that line super intentional? Yeah, you know, John, I think one of the confluences of our projects um, is this interrogation or exploration, maybe interrogation is the right word, of, uh, yeah. of, of what it means to be biracial in America and all of those little violences that come along with that, like sometimes like from within your own family. Um, mm -hmm. So I think a lot of um, friends and fellow poets read my book before it went to press and they were like, oh my gosh, like this was going on in your family. Like I didn't know about this abuse. And I'm just kind of like, well, it's violence, but not abuse. Mm -hmm. I don't think like, it's not like registering it like with it, w the way the way that it registered, at least within my Chinese family. Right. Mm -hmm where like my dad is the most doting and protective and self-restrained father imaginable. And his family's over there, like, you don't discipline these kids enough. Like you went to America and your kids are running wild. My brother's like left-handed. And I really wanted this to find its way into a poem, maybe a poem that would have like softened uh, the poem that, that you're talking about. Um, but we're all just sitting around the table. It's the first time we've been back to Taiwan in a long time. Um, I think I was six. So my little brother must've been just four. He's left-handed. And every time he reached for food, someone just slapped him. Like, not like a little reprimand, like hard, like <laughs> trying to like change his muscle memory, you know? So his reflex was to like no longer eat with his left hand. Oh, wow. And um, my dad was so embarrassed that this was happening. And my mom was like so mad that my dad was embarrassed instead of like angry and stuff. I just, I, I mean, I barely remember I was six. So I don't want my parents to watch this and be like, you're attributing all these false emotions to us. But, <laughs> um, you know, I was like keenly aware uh, of the sort of tension between my mom just kind of being like into sort of like gentle hippy dippy, like uh, 1980s American parenting and my dad being like, this is an embarrassment to my family, mm. right? And so I think that that tension running through this poem and some of the other poems as well um, is a far greater violence <laughs> than any of the actual punches that get thrown in this book. Um, yeah, I think it's been intensified in, in recent times. Like, I don't know, um, <laughs> you know, like I think, I, the past few years have been an interesting time to be Asian American, especially in rural sure. Idaho, where I grew up and where my parents still live. And there's this sense of like, when I go home, I'm, well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I left uh, Idaho in 2017. And shortly before I did, I remember going to uh, one of the places where I'd been going, like backpacking alone since I was a teenager and getting chased to the trailhead by a car that like a truck, it followed me really closely for a while and then hoisted a Confederate flag and just tailgated oh, me to yeah. the trailhead. And I was just sort of like, mm, and just turned around and went back home. And I was like, I can't go to the places that I've loved. And my dad has wow. kind of gotten to be the same way. He doesn't want to go out into the wilderness. And if you're in rural Idaho, then going anywhere kind of, you know, people involves like going into the, into these rural places. And my mom seems to have this like deep frustration with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I think if you walk through your life, like not really understanding, even if you like, you know, even if your family, um, 
uh, gets gets a, you know just sort of like uh, that kind of attention in public. If you're not walking through it in your own skin, I think mm-hmm. it forever catches you by surprise. Yeah. And so these like you know just little fault lines have started to emerge, um, and that's hard. Um, Was any of this written during that time? Yes, that's when uh, this was written. Wow. Yeah. So you were really experiencing that. Wow. Huh. Okay. So um, so I have another question about one of the poems you read, which was Scansion Between the Ropes. Um, I, it, just for my own sake, and I'm, I'm hoping other readers probably have the same question. I'm just curious about like the origin of this poem um, because... You know, there, there's the the whole tendency to call boxing the sweet science, but we don't like MMA doesn't have like such nice terminology about it. And like you truly found the poetry in fighting, like you're talking about the I am and the Anapest and and referring to to jab and cross counts. Like just what was this one of the early ones? Was this one of the first ones you wrote for the collection? Did this come later? Like I'm just I'm I'm totally into the origin story of this one. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think the, the first thing uh, to say I have to say about that is that um, the origin story is in the book. I don't think you can tell it's the origin story so much anymore because we cut it into two poems. Um, and I think what, what got gained was the ability for this little piece to work as kind of an ars poetica um, okay. for the project, but also like an Ars Poetica for, for cage fighting, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's so funny, I think, you know, just being like spanning these two worlds of writing and fighting, I think we're very much on the same wavelength. We're probably reading some of the same people. But, but as soon as you asked that, I was just sort of like a sweet science of bruising. Like, of course, I was like reading, uh, you know, AJ Liebling and all that sort of like mid-century, like um, uh, boxing writing. Um, right, you know, I was absolutely right. steeped in that, amongst other things, as I was working on this. Um, and so I think that is part of the origin story. It's funny that you talk about the phrase, the sweet science, because I spent so long thinking about what if, if, if boxing is the sweet science of, of, uh, of bruising, what is MMA the science of? Uh, and never reached a satisfactory ex- uh, answer. I, I think maybe it's not. <laughs> it's not That's a, a great question, though, because um, I always feel like there's so much science and and art to the art, you know, to the to the collection of arts, but. Um... Oh man, that's a great question. I'm going to be thinking about that long after this, <laughs> this event. So why did you settle on muscle memory? Um. I think so one of the poems in here is actually titled muscle memory mm-hmm. so in a sense it was a sort of easy pull from that poem and the reason it was such an easy pull from that poem I think is because uh you know muscle memory is at least the way I fight I'm not a fighter who's fueled by rage I'm not a <laughs> I, you know, I, I used to run track. That was like my life uh, growing up. I went to college on a track scholarship and I was the kind of person who like, sometimes I would win a national championship uh, or set a school record and do all these things. And sometimes I would like choke like so terribly. <laughs> and it, I think what it kind of came down to is I am the kind of person who cannot think while I'm doing a sport. Every single moment of it needs to be practiced and drilled so many times that my body knows what to do. And I just have to let my head get out of the way um yeah I will never be someone who can like think or react in that way so you know like back in the running days everyone would have their game plans and like who they were going to compete with and this and that and my coach like what we eventually like agreed upon is that they hundreds of race where it's really painful everyone's rinsed with 200 meters left to go because you're almost done and most people can endure the pain for 200 meters <laughs> and he was just like you I'm never going to have a thought about competing 
you are simply going to sprint as hard as you can at 300 meters instead of 200 meters and open up the biggest lead you can in that 100 meters where everyone else is like, yeah, we're not doing this. Uh, and then hope you can hang on for the rest of the race, you know? Um, and I think that's the mentality I took into the cage as well. You know, it was like, watch the tape, see what I think the other person is going to do, have that sort of cerebral, like interactive uh, part of the thing be like, watching tape preparing and then mm -hmm. just choose a set of things to drill that i thought would win the fight and then turn off my brain um and the thing is your muscle memory serves you really well sometimes <laughs> and then sometimes you're like oh no i drilled yeah. these five things and now things are going sideways and if you're the kind of person like me who doesn't respond that well to things going all of a sudden you're like why why <laughs> why am i in the cage right now right um and so I started thinking about like, well, this isn't just who I am doing sports. Like, this is how I, this is who I am when I'm interacting with my family. This is who I am like at work when I'm like, you know, um, trying to advocate for marginalized students, right? Like, I'm like, what can we drill? What are the things we can practice? Like, where are we going to put our heart and make our investments? And then when things kind of don't work out that way, it's like all of those things that you practiced some, sometimes come back to hurt you, right? Like hmm. this is why I was so, I wanted, the, I wanted to write the poem about my brother getting his wrist slapped and I just couldn't, I couldn't find its shape. Um, but I think that's a perfect example, right? Like muscle memory is not always a good thing. It serves some of us well in our competitive lives, mm -hmm. but it's the result of, of, of pain and it's the result of deprivation and it's the result of people like teaching you that you must do a specific thing and not another thing. Um, so in that sense, I, I mean it both as the sort of muscle memory we develop in sports and also as a way of sort of figuring these kinds of like generational trauma um, where we just sort of like <laughs> carry our, our, our family's challenges and grievances uh, across continents and across decades and yeah, you know, from from father to daughter to now my own mm. daughter. It's interesting that you said you use it in your you you mentioned how you would use it with your students in terms of advocating for marginalized students. But like how I'm, I'm really curious, because as soon as you said it, I was trying to think about how you might do this. How do you how do you feel muscle memory serves you in navigating your family? Like, how do you how do you turn your mind off and just allow your 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 muscle memory to take you through those interactions because that's fascinating to me <laughs> gardening it's like what does gardening have to do with the rest uh, okay. of it and just you know like my dad and i have like gardened together um for, for as long as i can remember right mm -hmm. and like people who see us from the out outside think we are like so similar and he and i struggle to get along uh despite having so many shared interests and uh I'll, you know I'm, I'm aware that we have similar personalities right so having this sort of like physical task that we can do together and a way of sort of like having that kind of connectivity like even if we're in some other dispute there's like the times of year when we do these things there's a reason to get together um there's like all of this just sort of like questions about like, well, how do you cultivate something? How do you make it grow? And then there's also, I think what ends up being like a really convenient metaphor, like as, as I think the poem kind of like self scathingly points out, right? It's a metaphor. It's right there. You gotta pluck it, right? Um, but a lot of what we grew was uh, Asian vegetables. And so this sense of like using these, this sort of like physical labor and the cadences of the seasons and this time that we spent together to cultivate uh, this last little remnant of, um, you know, his just sort of uh, uh, connection to China, just on this little uh, patch of mountainside in rural Idaho. Um, That's great. So I know we only have like, 10-ish minutes before we have to let other people ask questions. So I got to be selfish and, and just ask you two others because there were a lot, there were two lines in particular that like just punched me in the gut. I got to use the metaphor. We were talking fighting. Um, and I'm, now I have to, now I got to look at my notes. So I'm going to, you're going to have to help me with which poem it was. But the, the opening line was, show me where your pain is. And your answer was, my father is an Im immigrant. Like that was the answer. Like, tell me about that line. Cause that like hit me like a ton of bricks. Like what, what, 
why why was that your pain in that moment and that and for that poem because i mean the rest of the poem poem is beautiful but that when you talk about a line that just grabs you right away that is that was amazing yeah thank you um, <laughs> in that poem i think that that line becomes it's a true answer but it's also the easy answer right mm -hmm. and i think one of the through lines of this book and one of the other things people always ask is like well what does what do fighting and writing like have to do with each other like what drew you to both of them and i was like oh. writing gets so heady and cerebral and grappling gives you like a body to hang on to right mm -hmm. like um it gives you some way of being like you know you could still practice the moves in your head like a chess game but then you know, I'm sure you know, like you, I, I watch YouTube videos of like, you know, sneaky little moves all day and none of it matters. You can still get on the mats and like you're starting from scratch. Like how yep. did they end up upside down with a leg there? Like, Every time. <laughs> um, so I always loved that about, about fighting, just the way that mm -hmm. those like cor the corporal was like foregrounded. Right. Um, and the way, you know, we're just nothing without having something to like, grab onto um mm -hmm. and you know when we tell stories about ourselves and our families some of those stories are also just sort of like complicated and vanishing and sort of the equivalent of all of a sudden realizing you don't know how to do it and you're like upside down and confused right um and then some of them are just sort of like comfortable simplistic like easy answers that aren't wrong but mm -hmm. aren't but aren't the whole answer um mm -hmm. and so i think Another one of my anxieties before this book came out was that like, I am half Chinese. Um, my dad immigrated from China to Taiwan to the US. Um, I actually, I was born in Pennsylvania. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and then ended up moving out uh, with my family to Idaho and I was just three, right? Okay. So um, when this gets sort of like captured as like a very Chinese book, I'm like, yes. <laughs> It is, and mm -hmm. that's half of me, right? Um, that's half of my heritage. And the other, you know, I think the complicated thing about my family is some of these things that like seem as if they would be sort of like Chinese stereotypes, the sort of like interiority and the austerity and all of this mm -hmm. comes every bit, uh, perhaps more from, from my mom, who is mm. like Slovenia, Dutch, <laughs> <laughs> the most solitary autonomous like internally focused person who I've ever known right um and so I think sorting those things out was really important to me and I guess that poem kind of calls myself out for saying well yeah like that's the easy answer mm. is like with my dad you know it's these sort of like big um traumas and like big journeys from one continent to another mm -hmm. um and I think one of the challenges I faced in my personal life was just sort of being like, so I've had some crappy things happen to me in my life and none of them hold a candle to those things that he went through. Right. So how do we like right. carve out spaces for smaller griefs and smaller sufferings that are like, nonetheless, like very real to us. And I guess yeah. I had those same questions about my mom, like as someone who I love dearly, who has always seemed like far from me. Mm -hmm. Right. Just mm -hmm. to say, okay, like, well, what is that story? And what does that story look like if it can't be told through the lens of diaspora? Um, so I think that's part of what that poem is, is trying to do. There's the, there's the gut punch, comfortable answer, which is utterly real. And probably most of the book is devoted to unpacking that question. And then there's this other, this other side to balance things as well. And it's interesting that you say that because I don't, you don't, I, you don't get into that at least at a, at a very explicit level, you know, like it doesn't, that, that exploring that side and, and the, the, that distance from your mother doesn't seem as, as, as explicit as the relationship with your father. Was that intentional? Was that just how this work came out? Like, is that, how, how did that, how did that end up happening that way? <laughs> That's just how this came out. I guess yeah. we learn about ourselves through our writing, you know? For sure, like, for sure. I talk, I talk to my mom often almost every day now because i have like kids who demand to see their grandmother every single day and facetime <laughs> exists so why not you know right um, 
and I don't talk to my dad all that often. So I, mm. I mean, maybe that's the balance. Maybe my mom and I like hash through things every day. And my, my dad and I are having this uh, slow motion conversation through poetry. Um, <laughs> one of the things that happens in the book, as I was working on this, he started um, translating uh, traditional Chinese poetry. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this book really did open a new kind of conversation um, that the two of us had never had before. Uh, so I, I think that that sort of like newly available way of conversing is one of the things that shaped this book. I think it's also, I mean, one of my just things that I hold most dear about writing is the way that it can open these conversations and forge relationships uh, you know, like my parents have been right there in front of me like my whole life. And now, I, you know, I started working on this and we started talking about new things. That's amazing. Um, how much time do we have? All right. One other line. I just I have <laughs> to ask about it. And then I, then I, I kind of actually want to ask sort of a craft question for any like, you know, writers that may be listening. Um, and again, I sorry, I'm trying to like go through my notes quickly because I have a lot of them. And now I'm going to forget the title of the poem again. But uh, it was another one you read. Uh, with the heel hooks, but we, it was the last line talking about um, healing by doing nothing. Like that one was another one that just struck me. Um, and I wondered if that had a larger meaning in in the sense of relationships with your parents, relationships with others. Like, are we working too hard to, to heal relationships that maybe shouldn't be healed or, you know, what? So I'm, I'm just wondering kind of, again, the origin of that line was what was what was meant beyond what was on the page because it was it was a beautifully written one <laughs> yeah uh, so that is the final line from uh the poem how many stages of grief that was it, it. um i think maybe this this is a good question to bring our conversation full circle here okay because in the first poem, I, I think I, I am I'm emphatic that that's not really a poem about sort of like extraordinary violence within my family, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. But at the same time, I think what, what happens through that is like the, in the dynamics of my family, um, <laughs> violence was not something that you walked away from, like in the little ways that showed up in life. And maybe I mean, maybe this is what I learned from my family maybe it's just me like I have th these like memories like when I was very again like my parents had different ideas about parenting and so they would give us a choice like if we did something like horribly amiss they'd be like would you like a spanking or would you like some other punishment like some sort of like long-term grounding and the one I remember was like they wanted they had just given me a pair of like unit of, of, of uh, earrings with with ponies on them and I loved horses and this, these earrings were like my prized possession and they're like would you like a spanking or would you like to lose your earrings right oh. I was just sort of like well that's obvious like you know just <laughs> like I'm here for the spanking right like no <laughs> not you know not a moment's hesitation about that um and so I think I was, I was just sort of like Mel, like bring it on right and um that's the kind of runner I was too. I was telling you a little story about that. I was just mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I'm not good at some parts of this, but what I can do is confront the pain a hundred meters earlier than what any of the rest of you were able to do. Um, it's how I, it's how I fought. And because everyone kind of realized like Jenny, <laughs> I'm really bad boxer. That poem was not joking. <laughs> um, but what I am willing to do is like eat the punches without balking until I have the opportunity to use my jujitsu, right? Um, and so that, I think that was something that in all aspects of my life, uh, you know, that was cultivated. And I say it with pride, like as an athlete, right? Um, but I think this set me up for violence in other in other uh, domains of, mm. of my life. You know, I think in particular when it comes to like domestic violence where mm -hmm. other people might see red flags and I am just sort of like, surely I can suffer through this, right? Um, so I think that there is a way, right? I think uh, there's, I, I can't remember which of my poems is in now, because of, uh, but uh, one of them uh, is uh, talking about, it has a line like, you, ne you never show them where you're hurt, right? Yes. 
Yep. That was like such a virtue in all aspects of my life. And like, I think, uh, yeah, just absolute poker face, no matter what was happening. And I think that ended up being a really dangerous thing to bring beyond the arena of competitive sports and into the rest of life. Um, mm. So that poem is kind of like, <laughs> Also, like, as, as was your protagonist, I'm on the wrong side of 30. Now I'm on the very wrong <laughs> side of 30. I'm almost on the wrong side of 40. But at that point, wrong side of 30, I was kind of ready to, like, start moving towards retirement from the sport. Um, I loved it so much, but it was exactly what I'm just talking about here, where I was like, I need, I need to switch up some things in mm. my life and move just towards a gentler way of being in the world. Um, and how do you get out of that mindset where you're just sort of like, oh, everything's fine. I'm going to endure this. My first idiotic response was that I was like proud that I had ruptured an eardrum and everyone was like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> like, why, what kind of response is that? You know, and like, um, it really kind of took some thinking to be like, what would it take for me not to be proud of this anymore? <laughs> um, and maybe we don't have hmm. an answer that because I still am kind of proud of that and so yeah. it's not just like what's the physical damage that this board inflicted on me it's just kind mm -hmm. of like well like what about all of these other emotional and intellectual habits um how much do you have to walk away from them or is there a way to sort of continue to pursue them uh without uh bringing along all of the harm so we're talking about how you and I both do jujitsu now. Like I found that jujitsu tournaments are the happy medium, right? They really <laughs> are. They really are. Without Although, like, I'm still upset. I like after years of doing this, I still have no cauliflower ear. It's like the same thing. It's like, well, when do I get mine? You know, it's like, but you know, I don't really want it. I'm like, I don't really want my ears to look like that. But you're right. There's this sort of weird, you know, the the ruptured eardrum. Like, I ruptured my eardrum. I'm I'm tough. I got, got it. But yeah, I, it's, and I think that's to your point about how both of our, our works are works of interrogation. You know, my, my, my question in this book is like, uh, you know, why do we watch these sports? Why do we participate in them? And yet the, the pay-per-view that's coming up, I, I'm not missing it. Like, I, I want to see it. I want to watch it. Um, I do know that, like, I, I shared at one of the readings that I was at that, like, I think for the first time ever, last year i turned off a fight i couldn't watch it anymore um it was between max holloway and calvin guitar and calvin guitar was just taken up beating like he was just too tough for his own good wouldn't go down by the third round he looked like he needed to be out of there and it was a five round fight and it was the first time i was ever like i can't i can't do it anymore and i had been working you know the, the book had been we were close to publication at that point so i, I was in kind of a different headspace about it but but I'm still asking that question and I have no answer, but like, I can watch a great football game. I can watch, you know, I can watch the longest 12 round boxing match, um, knowing what, what is happening on the other end of this thing. And, um, but we still do, it's, it's still, a, it's still a thing. Do you have an answer? Cause I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think we're supposed to be moving close to Q and A, right? I don't know if Dave is there. I think he said he was going to handle some of the Q and A, or I can grab him out of the out of the box there. Dave, are you there? Is it Dave? Right? No. All right. Well, maybe I'll just uh, should. What do you think? Should we go into him, Jenny? The Q and A. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. So, Kevin's first question, John. Thank you for writing such an excellent book. Thank you for saying that. Um, your novel and Atticus Lish's The War for Gloria, also about an MMA fighter, two of the best novels I've read in recent years. Wow. Thank you again. Have you two ever met? No. And I actually was not aware of the book, but I just added one to my uh, my TBR list. Um, no, I, I have not not met her, don't know or him or her. I'm not sure of the name, um, but I will absolutely be looking that up. And thank you for the, the compliment. Um, Oh, there we go. He's in. <laughs> I have read that in this blended. Yeah. <laughs> is, uh, is it good? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm here for our next question is for both of you. Uh, this viewer says you both write so compellingly about the surrender and trust and mistrust of the relationship between the coach and the fighter. Can you talk about why this was important or interesting for you to write about? 
Jenny, I'll let you take that first. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe, gosh, the place to begin to unpack my feelings on that. <laughs> 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 Most of the people I love are who show up in this book have their real names in here. And all of the coaches who show up in this book are combined into one specter of a problematic coach. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. And, with a pseudonym. That is no one's name. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because the relationship is so between a fighter and a coach is so utterly problematic. Um, and I think that those relationships are raced and they're gendered. And being a woman in this sport at a time when like women's MMA was like pretty new, um, it was really hard to find people who could walk that line between supporting your career <laughs> without objectifying you mm. because part of what they had to do to support your career was um, <laughs> to objectify you, <laughs> right? Uh, and so... Yeah, I, I guess I guess that's how I that's how I would start start that conversation. It's just sort of like, well, okay, like what does trust look like in this arena when someone doing their best for you is gonna be like, okay, like uh, you know, like uh let's get you out there in a bikini for some photographs. <laughs> and then it's right. sort of like, where's the part where I get to like rip someone's arm off? That's that's what I want to get to here. <laughs> Um, I think for me, it had to do, uh, you know, to your point, there's, there's a lot of uh, race and gender um, issues that come up with that kind of relationship. I, I was specifically exploring the ideas of masculinity and uh, sort of the toxic side of masculinity and what it's like to have someone who cares for you and tells you they care for you and believe that they care for you. And, and they probably do care for you, but then are also able to put you into this situation that is often detrimental to your health. <laughs> it's, um, you know, whether it's cutting weight, whether it's like that Calvin Qatar fight where his coaches are telling him, get up off the stool, get back in there. You're not knocked out. Like it's, that's a, that's a, a really complex. And I think uh nuanced relationship that doesn't, typically get expo explored in fight literature or fight cinema. You know, it's always just about how motivational that coach is. It's Mickey getting rocked back in for another round. It's not like, hey, we should probably throw the towel in this fight. This guy's this this guy or this woman is not fit to go back in. We don't really because that's not a comfortable conversation to have, right? Like, because that goes back to our whole interrogation of why we watch these sports in the first place. So to me, I kind of wanted to explore that relationship at a level that we don't really talk about it, which is, do they truly have your best interest at heart? They may be telling you that with their mouth, but they're not necessarily showing you that with their actions. <laughs> That's funny because I, I always loathed the showmanship side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but when, it, you know, and I felt that like some of my coaches like exploited me in certain ways, but when it came time to the cage, like, I think they were, if anything, fell on the side of like throwing in the white towel early, partly because like they thought of me as like their little girl or something. Right. Uh, and then partly yeah. I am a crappy boxer. So until <laughs> I win, it really looks like I'm losing. And so I was, I was always, I had this paranoia, not that someone would wait too long or make me get up. I had this paranoia that they'd call it too soon because they didn't believe in me. So I always had this ultimatum with my coaches where I was like, <laughs> I mean, the little pushing back I got to do against them was like, if you ever throw in the towel, like I will leave you. I will find a new coach. Never, ever, ever do that. Like I'll get knocked out before I let you do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> which I did. <laughs> um, our next question has to do with uh, the pains of fighting. You both write viscerally about them, this viewer says. So um, if you could talk a little about this, about this as a way to communicate your themes in your writing. Ooh, that's a good one. Hila's asking all the good questions. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, I mean, some of that came from uh, personal experience as a sports medicine PT. 
Um, I was a physical therapist for, for 10 years and I worked with both concussive sports athletes and uh, Alzheimer and dementia patients that were, you know, age specific in a nursing home or in home care. So, um, which was actually a big impetus for, for this book was sort of bridging that gap between people who are expected to have it at a certain age and people who sort of bring it upon themselves by the sports in which they participate. Um, so uh, I, I, I appreciate books that, and, and writing that feels lived in and feels authentic. And so I, to me, I didn't want to pull, to pardon the pun, but I didn't want to pull any punches about what these symptoms look like, not only how they affect the people that have them, but also the people in their orbit, which are their caregivers, their family. Um, you know, to me, that was the best way to communicate, like how serious these issues were, was to be as, as visceral as I could about it without being ex exploitative. Um, so that's, that's kind of my answer for that one. Hope that answers your question. For, for me, this is going to sound very paradoxical. Um, so, you know, CTE is the specter that hangs over our sport. And one of my best friends is a neurosurgeon. So I like heard about this, like on the daily, a neurosurgeon who does not appreciate the beautiful violence of the cage. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so this is always at the forefront of my mind. And maybe the way that I justified it to myself, which I think is backed up by some scientific research, although, it, you know, I might be uh, using that to see what I want to see, um, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, brain traumas come from like repeated smaller blows, right? Like it builds up over, I mean, you don't want to get a huge concussion, but it also mm. like builds up over time. And there's, uh, I don't know, I got, I went down the rabbit hole reading these, uh, reading these studies on how bigger boxing gloves were actually a problem because you could mm -hmm. eat some hits yep. and it wouldn't cut you up and it wouldn't mess you up in the moment. Mm -hmm. And how MMA with those sharp little gloves might actually be a good thing, right? Because, I mean, you can mess up someone's face, but you're going to, like, open a cut. You're going to break their nose. You're going right. to have this superficial damage and maybe, like, uh, leave your brain intact. Uh, so in some weird sense, I, I say this with, sorry, I'm also on my phone, so I'm like, I can zoom in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I, I broke my nose once fighting and several times doing like idiotic dares unrelated to fighting. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also sliced, I got my, I got my eyebrow, this eyebrow sliced completely open and then stitched shut cage side. Uh, and then this one, uh, I, uh, jujitsu just someone like you know, stretched my face out and then bumped it with their heel and just opened this huge like tension mm. wound, uh, across that eyebrow right um so all of these like little injuries and I guess I always welcomed them in some odd way it was like those little things were in my mind <laughs> the way that like I kept myself safe from the big things like good things skin and noses and all of these things are so <laughs> fragile if you're not wearing boxing gloves uh, because, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of blood, but the fight's going to stop before, before you do that repeated trauma to your brain. Um, so I understand that this is not the whole story and it doesn't really make sense, but when you're going to step into a cage, uh, you find the little things to tell yourself, the little mantras <laughs> that you feel safe. And this, I think, is like really similar to like what's at the core of writing a poem for me, right? Like mm. you have this little condensation nuclei. They're, they're not the whole story. They're not the whole truth, but they're a way of thinking about things that opens up other ways of thinking about things and allows you to kind of like explore your fears and your sometimes paradoxical responses to those fears um, in a way that like is anchored in something concrete, right? It's like anchored like in a ruptured eardrum or a broken nose or um, I, one of the poems in my collection is like really a teammate uh, splits his head open. Like when we we're sparring, I got, I should rephrase that. I accidentally split a teammate's scalp open like while we were fighting. And you don't feel these things in the moment. You have so much adrenaline that, you know, it's just like, you're just like, well, like where's the blood coming from? Everyone's like, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Someone check me, is it me? Right? Um, and then just sort of like, actually be like, oh no, it's you. And he'll be like, it's not me. And maybe like, I'm going to touch it right now. <laughs> like, this is, do you not feel that? Like, this is your head it's bleeding right um and to me that's kind of how a poem 
works too. And this might be another one of those like weird little mantra connections for me. Um, but one of the things that it has always connected fighting and writing for me is that moment where Emily Dickinson says uh, that, I mean, this is a very poor paraphrase, uh, but that like uh, uh, reading a poem is like the top of your head coming off, right? Mm. Uh, just, uh, just this absolutely visceral, like, that's not visceral, but this like physical sensation of what a poem is um, has so much in common uh, for me with like uh, that, I guess what it feels like to get her in the cage. Yeah. Very good. Okay, I think that is about it for tonight. We're reaching the top of the hour. Uh, Jenny and John, thank you for joining us on At Home with Literati tonight. And thank, thank you to our viewers as well. Make sure to buy the book. The link is in the chat on the event listing that brought you here. And of course, in our store. Thank you for your support. And we'll see you at the next event. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Take care, Jenny. Congratulations. Right, thanks. Bye, John. Bye, everyone.